Hi guys, this is the video for um, the Chem 111 review. Before we really get into um, organic chemistry, I know a lot of you have been out of class for a while, or maybe you've just forgotten something in the few weeks that you've been out. Either way, um, it's a really good idea to go ahead and take some time to review some of those concepts because this is a big unit on geometry and structure and nomenclature and it can be overwhelming if you haven't been looking at that material for a while. So with that in mind, this video is only going to be focusing on the first part of this unit. We're going to really go through um, some uh, Chem 111 concepts including Lewis structures, um, electronegativity, why bonds form, the polarity, and then the geometry according to VSEPR. And we will get into a little bit of hybridization just because it's going to help us with organic chemistry um, in general. Okay. So let's go ahead and look at these topics. I'm going to start with Lewis structures just because well, that's a good place to start. And then we'll get into what the Lewis structures really mean, okay? So this is the periodic table that you guys will be getting on your exam. Um, you'll notice that all of the symbols are filled in. You'll notice that, um, you know, there's numbers and things on here. You don't have to memorize much of this for me. And that's because, um, I mean, that's 111 stuff. 112 is a whole different ballpark. So this is the periodic table that you get. I'm going to be sending um, probably an announcement with it, or it's going to be under the announcement section. I like to ha give you guys this periodic table in the beginning of the semester just so you're comfortable working with it. Um, and you can kind of tell this is the website that where, I, where it's stored. Um, but really, it, it's just a periodic table. So now as we look at Lewis structures, remember we draw Lewis structures with an electron as a dot, okay? Now the number of valence electrons that each group has is um, somewhat intuitive. So we can name this group, you know, one, two, three, four. Notice I'm only dealing with the main group elements, the representative elements. I'm not dealing with these transitions for the moment, okay? So everything in group one has one valence electron. Everything in group two is going to have two valence electrons. And so if we go to this, you know, this is group one, so it has one valence electron. Now it doesn't matter to me, you could draw it on the side, you could draw it down here. Um, I typically go in clockwise orientation just so that, uh, well, I'm slightly OCD, but that's not the point here. Um, I like to be systematic. Everything in group two, magnesium, beryllium, there's going to be two. Now we do not pair those electrons. And that's because Hund's rule says um, you don't pair electrons until you absolutely have to. They don't like each other. They are all negatively charged. And so instead, we're going to put one electron on one side, one electron on another side. Doesn't matter. Again, I typically go clockwise, but do what you feel is right. Group three should have three. One, two, three. Group four, now we have an electron on one of each of four sides. Four electrons, one on each of four sides. Um, and so that's when group five, we can now start to pair. And so something like phosphorus, you do one, two, three, four, and then I'm just going to add a fifth. Group six um, has six valence electrons. Group seven has seven and group eight typically has eight. Now, we can also make an assumption about how many bonds something is going to want to form from these Lewis structures. You can kind of tell lithium only wants to form one, which is something why something like lithium chloride, there's only, you know, one bond there. Um, beryllium, on the other hand, there's a place here and a place here. They're going to form two bonds. 
So this is going to form one bond, two bonds usually. Boron is going to probably form three bonds. Carbon forms four. Nitrogen forms, there's only a place for one, two, three. So three bonds, two spots here, and one spot here. Now, there are exceptions to this, okay, guys? Um, but for the most part, you can kind of see what the trend should be. And it's going to kind of come in handy as we get to organic chemistry and we start playing around with um, carbon in particular. Now, remember, um, just as a side note, that most elements uh, are present naturally at in their monatomic state, but Hofbrinkles, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine are all elements that are diatomic naturally. And so you're not just going to find an H floating around. It's going to be H2. O just isn't floating around. We breathe in O2 and that kind of thing. So going back to the periodic table, remember that as we're looking at this periodic table, the whole point of um, forming bonds and everything else is to try and get to this noble gas configuration. Now, for the most part, that means everybody wants eight electrons, but that's not true for everyone. Um, helium, for example, there's two protons, atomic numbers two, so there's going to be two electrons when it's neutral. Now, so the elements that are trying to be like helium, hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, um, these are going to want to have a, um, a, a, a duet. They want to really just have those two um, valence electrons. Um, if you think back to configuration, it would be like 1s2 or helium and then other things. The whole point is to get to this noble gas configuration. Everything else on the other on the periodic table would prefer usually to have an octet. They want to have eight valence electrons. Um, and so the idea, hmm, let's go back. The idea is that as we are getting to this, things like here where you've got seven, six valence electrons, they're going to try and gain one. So everything in this group is going to have a charge of minus one when they form an ion. How did that happen? Everything in group two, it's going to ha it already has six. It wants eight, so it's going to try and gain one, two valence electrons. So it's going to have a two minus charge. Over here, something like sodium. It's only got to lose one to look like neon. And so losing an electron is going to give a plus one charge. So everything in this column wants a plus one charge. And so you can kind of think back to this um, set of concepts in 111 to help you through this. Um, but just kind of remember things on this side of the periodic table want to lose electrons. Things over here want to gain electrons. And there's actually a property that we associate with that, and that's electronegativity. Electronegativity is the tendency to draw electrons to uh, it, well, an atom's tendency to draw electrons to itself. Um, it increases to the right and up within a group, um, with fluorine being the highest. Now, I don't expect you guys to know the electronegativity values. I just want you to know that the closer you are to fluorine, the more likely you are to uh, pull electrons towards your that atom. Now, um, what this really means, things over here, they don't have, you know, they still have electronegativity. They still have protons in their nucleus. They're still going to be likely to attract an electron, they just don't have as much of a pull. And it has to do with nuclear shielding and, you know, other kinds of things. But um, everything has some attraction for electrons. It's just that, that the strongest attraction, the strongest electronegativity is going to be with fluorine. 
So if we go into here, we can kind of talk for a minute about um, how these Lewis structures really indicate uh, an atom's trend to pull electrons towards it. You know, lithium would really rather just lose that electron and be, you know, in the helium configuration. Beryllium would really rather just lose two. Um, you look at fluorine, fluorine really wants to have a bond, pull that electron density towards itself and really just fulfill that octet. Oxygen has pretty high electronegativity. It's going to try and form two bonds, draw those electrons to it, and it'll be pretty stable at that point. So the whole point of a chemical bond is to try and get the atom to a stable configuration, whether that's by losing electrons like here or gaining electrons, you know, through a bond like fluorine. Um, the idea is you have to make a stable configuration, okay? So a chemical bond is going to be anything that holds, any force that holds atoms together and allows them to function as a single unit. They're going to have um, the properties that are going to be, you know, con consistent with, you know, the fact that they're bonded, that kind of thing. Now, generally, it's going to be to form that duet or octet. <clears throat> The other thing that will make a bond form is to get an overall lower energy aggregate. Um, you know, you have a free radical floating around, it's going to try and react as much as it can just to kind of get to that lower energy state. Now, the other thing to kind of remember is that bond length is going to be optimum. And what that means is it's going to allow the protons from one nucleus and I know this is a super simple drawing. The idea is that as these guys get closer together, the bond length is going to be optimized so that this nucleus can be attracted to the electron from that uh, atom. The nucleus in this atom can be attracted to the electron from the other while minimizing repulsions between the two nuclei. Okay? Now there's well, really, there's three types of bonding, but we're going to deal with two types of bonding for right now. <clears throat> the first is ionic bonding. Ionic bonding is when an electron is transferred. Usually, it's going to be from a metal to a non-metal, and it has to do with the fact that there's a really high electronegativity difference. And so if we go back for a second, yeah, keep it, um, to this, oh, actually, look, I already had it right here. Isn't that smart? So if we go to the periodic table for a second, there is um, really high electronegativities over here with fluorine, really low electronegativities over here with metals. And so anytime you have a metal plus nonmetal, the tendency, uh, the high electronegativity of the nonmetal will pull that electron to it. So you're not going to have a bond like Na, well, let's do Lewis structures really quick. Na is in group one. Chlorine is in group seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to move this down just to make it a little easier. And so as these form a bond, no clue how that happens. I must be leaning on the screen. The bond does form, but you notice like there is a distinct separation here. The higher electronegativity chlorine pulls the electron towards it, and so you end up getting a positive charge over here, a negative charge over here, and that transfer is what is called an ionic bond. What holds these atoms or ions together is the fact that the positively charged metal, the negatively charged nonmetal are you know, attracted to each other. And so they will sit next to each other in a crystal structure um, without, you know, complaining. The other type of bond is a covalent bond. This is going to be between two nonmetals. It results from two atoms sharing electrons. Now, that's something like, you know, nitrogen to nitrogen or bromine to iodine. Um, now, the 
key here, guys, is if you've ever tried to share anything, like say the remote, football season is um, a key example in my house. Um, my toddler prefers, oh golly, so many things. Let's go with, um, there's this new DC superhero girls thing. Um, so she wants to watch that like all the time. And then my husband wants to watch the game. And so they share the remote, but it's not as equal as you might think. It's not like, okay, you get an hour, I get an hour. It's, you know, obviously the child wins a lot more. And so when you have this unequal sharing, it's called a polar bond. If you've ever heard, you know, like bipolar disorder, north and south poles of the earth, these are all instances where you have an unequal, unlevel um, situation where it's not going to be even all the way across, you know. And so what happens here for these type of bonds, um, and I'm going to use, let's use carbon and oxygen. Carbon, three, four, has four valence electrons. Oxygen, and I'm only going to draw this one bond because we're going to do VSEPR in a minute. Only wants these two, and so these guys will form a bond, these guys will form a bond, and so what's going to end up happening, and I'm not going to draw the rest of the molecule, okay? I need a little bit more space. is that even though this is a double bond, which you can draw like this or like this, either way, um, you notice that the electrons, even though they still belong to carbon and oxygen, are much closer to the oxygen. And this results in a slight charge uh, differential. And so you have like a delta negative, a delta positive, which just means even though there isn't really a charge, <sighs> Titan, shh, um, there is a tendency, kind of like being a pessimist versus an optimist, you know, glass half empty, half full. There's not really a full, Titan, hush, right here, come right here now, thank you. Um, even There's not really a full charge here, instead it's just a um, slight tendency, okay? So polar bonds result from unequal sharing. Here, this is going to be between two nonmetals. Okay. Um, now, for me, when we talk about uh, polar versus nonpolar and all of that, I'm going to give you kind of a cheat sheet on how to remember <clears throat> what type of bond it is in just a minute. But for right now, polar bonds are from unequal sharing. What that means is from unequal electronegativity values. Now, guys, I'm not asking you to memorize those values. I'm not even going to give you that chart. The way that we tell there's a different electronegativity value is that really, if it's two different nonmetals, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, they have different electronegativities. Okay? So any two different nonmetals, one exception being this, are going to have polar covalent bonds. This is the only time you're going to have two different nonmetals where this is going to be nonpolar. And I say this a few times so you won't forget. Remember, electronegativity is just the ability of an atom to pull the electrons towards itself, um, with fluorine having the highest. So when you have a polar molecule, you've got this delta positive, delta negative, the more electronegative um, atom is going to have, the more electron density the electrons are going to be. So like if I were to draw this as electrons, the electrons would be here. Um, they are still being shared. It's just that they are much closer to the fluorine. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when we have this kind of charge separation, we call that a dipole moment. Now, a dipole moment is... Um, 
just that polarity. And so sometimes you'll see it with the delta negative, delta positive. Sometimes you're going to see it with kind of a, um, a shading in your textbook either way. Um, but the probably the easiest way is with an arrow. And what we do is we draw the arrow in the direction that the electrons are going. So the electrons are being pulled to the fluorine. So they're going to be traveling to the fluorine. So the arrow goes to the fluorine. And then because chemists have a sense of humor, we just put a positive end on the other side to indicate, yeah, the electrons left, so now it's positive. Um, and so that's how we draw a dipole moment. Now, I know in a second this is probably going to talk over me. Oh, maybe it's not. Is that st really? There it goes. Okay. Um, I think I forgot to turn down my volume and I like to talk. Um, yeah, I keep. And so the idea here, guys, let's try that, is um, if you have a pol polar molecule and you uh, expose it to an electric field, what's going to happen is the negative ends are all going to align to the, be aiming at the positive. The positive ends are going to be aimed to the negative end. And even though so if you watch, all the molecules are slowly tilting so that they're going to be aligned like that. Now, um, the, there's a lot of implications for this in industry, um, but since this is not really a learning outcome, I'm not going to get into this here. Just know the fact that we can get molecules to kind of tilt in space just by, you know, exposing it to a magnet is really cool, um, which is why, like, you know, I went to the vet the other day and they gave me a magnet um, to put on the fridge and it was perfectly sized it was like um, you know right at that business card size what is that like three and a half by two or something and I I looked at it and I was like at first I actually did think it was a business card and I was like oh great and she said no don't put that in your wallet and you know magnet credit cards not a good idea um, same thing in many other you know, uh, applications. You put a magnet next to a credit card, it pretty much wipes the credit card. It, it changes all of the data on the credit card because it, the data aligns, the, the atoms align with the magnet and not for the data itself. And so just kind of keep in mind there are applications. This stuff is really neat. Um, anyway, back to bond polarity. So how do we remember whether a bond is polar or nonpolar? Um, for ionic, Ionic bonds are always going to be metal plus nonmetal. And we know that metals are on the left of the periodic table. And show. Yes, keep. Um, there it is. Metals are all of the blue. And hydrogen kind of counts a little bit there. Um, nonmetals are green. And then the semimetals, the metalloids, um, are the oranges. Okay. So if we have a metal and a nonmetal, it is an ionic bond. If it is a nonpolar bond, meaning completely equal sharing, that is going to be the same nonmetals, like oxygen bonded to oxygen, hydrogen bonded to hydrogen. The only other example here is carbon to hydrogen. I need you to know that that is nonpolar. They have essentially the same electronegativity. It's the only exception I need you to know about. And then polar covalent is two different nonmetals. Okay? So which of the following is an ionic bond? The most polar covalent bond, least polar covalent bond, nonpolar covalent bond. If you have not used my videos in the past, you know that what I really want you to do is um, to kind of struggle on your own for a few minutes. And that's not me being mean, guys. What happens is if you just sit and you listen to the answer, you're not going to be testing yourself on um, to prepare yourself for the exam, OK? So please go ahead, and anytime you see these application quizzes, hit pause, sit there and kind of think through it. Um, make yourself struggle a little bit. The more you struggle, um, I mean, don't, you know, torture yourself, but the more you struggle now, the easier the exam material is going to be, okay? So 
As we look at these, at this point I'm assuming you have pressed play and you've already known. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is look for the uh, ionic bond, which means I'm going to go through these and look for a metal bonded to a non-metal. And this has got to be the ionic bond because lithium is a metal and that's just how it goes. Now, a nonpolar bond means it has to be two non-metals that are the same bonded together. And so like that. Um, and then at least to nonpolar. Um, so kind of what I would do is I would kind of consider the periodic table. If you think back to the periodic table or if you scrolled, it's C, N, O, and F. I don't know why I keep doing that. There must be something I'm accidentally touching on the, the screen. But that's what it looks like. And so the further apart they are, um, the more polar it's going to be. Okay, so the bond between here and here is really going to be the biggest electronegativity difference. This is only next to each other, so their electronegativities are going to be really uh, similar. And so if it was me, and it is, I'm going to say that the most polar has to do with the furthest away, and so that is this one. And the least polar is going to be when they are right next to each other, which is going to be oxygen to fluorine. Okay. Now notice, guys, on um, uh, these, they're all to fluorine. I try to be pretty easy. It's all going to be across a row like this, or it's going to be down a column, um, you know, fluorine, chlorine, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I don't try to get but so mean here. Now, we've talked about bonds, and just as a quick reminder, these are of bonds. I didn't draw like the extra electrons in there, okay? It's not a molecule here. It was just the bond. Now let's consider molecules. And this is going to really get us into um, getting ready for organic. Now, technically, this is not a learning outcome for this unit, but it's a really good refresher. And I want to make sure that you can kind of see um, some of these trends as we move into that material, okay? So you can have a compound that's polar, you can have a compound that's nonpolar. Um, it doesn't matter even what type of bonds they have, you have to consider the orientation of the bonds. Um, just kind of like if you tied two sumo wrestlers to a rope and you had them tug of war, um, one of the sumo wrestlers could be bigger or they could be equal and the rope wouldn't really move. And so you have to consider, you know, those polar bonds, are they aligned to work against each other or are they going to um, cancel? So then we're going to consider the dipole moment of that molecule. Is it going to be overall, um, you know, canceling or not, you know? So just remember as we draw those dipole moments that uh, that will come into play. So a molecule can have polar bonds, but be nonpolar. So you have to consider the bonds themselves and the geometry. Now, for us guys, we're not going to get really detailed into the VSEPR during organic, but I'm still going to go through it here just so it kind of refreshes your memory, brings it back, and, you know, when we talk about carbon both now and in later units, it really helps to understand what it's doing in three dimensions, okay? <clears throat> so molecules are going to form to make, to either fulfill an octet or to make a stable molecule, okay? Now, the other thing is they're going to minimize their formal charges. So what that really means is it's just an ownership of electrons. Um, you kind of want to have what you're supposed to have, no more, no less. Um, Consider it like when you're balancing your checkbook. Um, you don't want your check, your your checking account balance to be either too high or too low compared to what you think it is. Um, because if it's too high, you know maybe you forgot to pay a bill. If it's too low, what'd you forget to consider? Um, you want it to be right what you think it is. So the VSEPR is just a valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Um, because electrons all have negative charges, they are going to try and get as far away from each other as they can. And the way they do that is in three dimensions, okay? So the rules for assigning VSEPR 
um, is to determine the total number of valence electrons that have to appear in this structure. Determine the central atom. It's going to be the one that is um, either the least electronegativity, electronegative, mm, electronegative, electro, yeah, sure, um, or it's going to be the one that can form the most bonds. For organic chemistry, guys, it's always going to be carbon. Um, if you go back to that slide, and I think I erased my ink, unfortunately. Um, where's my Lewis structures? Remember that carbon can actually have four bonds here because um, it's got four spots. <clears throat> there we go. Um, once you know the central atom, you go ahead and draw um, bonds from the central to everything else. You fill in your octets and then you count. If you have too many valence electrons, it means you really should have a double bond in there somewhere. You have too few. You need to add some more on the, the central atom as a lone pair. Now, um, yeah, and then we can count the formal charges. Um, I'm not going to get too detailed in on this as we move forward, but just I'm going to show you what the geometry looks like just so that you can kind of see. Um, and I think, there we go. Um, so this is not uh, probably the best video for seeing bond angles, but it does show you in three dimensions how bonds are going to form. So around, okay, I guess I have to watch it on YouTube. Can I do it here? I guess not. Um, ha 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 ha. That's why we always have the website and stuff right there. Okay, so guys, um, let me m m do. Uh, now, as we are doing this, um, just kind of keep in mind all of the geometries are going to be around the uh, central atom. And so, yeah, allow. Um, if you have two areas of electron density, you're going to have a nice 180 bond angle, and it's going to be a linear structure. Now, these bonds could be double, they could be, one could be double, one could be single, um, but if there's two areas of electron density, it's a linear molecule. Three areas of electron density, meaning, you know, it doesn't matter, one of these could be double, others could be single, it doesn't really matter. Um, the bond angle in three dimensions is going to be, it's going to be a flat planar molecule with 120 bond angles. If one of those is an alone pair, you can't really see a lone pair of electrons. Um, and so what you only see is this nice um, bent structure. And the bond angles are still about 120. Um, but remember, there's still going to be this alone pair up there. Now, carbon can form up to four bonds, and so it's this next uh, geometry that is the most important for us. Um, okay, oops. Another bent would be when you have four areas of electron density, two bonds, two lone pairs. Um, but here we go. Four areas of electron density could also have three bonds and one lone pair. This is trigonal pyramidal because the bond angles are 109-ish. Um, and um, where is tetrahedral? Did, there, did we skip it? Did I miss it? Is that it? Yes, here it is. I don't know why it's out of order. Um, but here's tetrahedral. There's four areas of electron density just like with um, with carbon, and so you have kind of a slight um, three-dimensional structure. It ends up being that going into that third dimension, you get bond angles of about 109 as opposed to 90, which would be um, which would be what you had if you go like this. And so it's um, really up to four areas of electron density that we want to deal with here. Okay, so. Let's look at a few structures here. Um, this is um, just kind of a, a way of going through um, these steps, okay? Just kind of, again, as a refresher for that lab that you did in 111. <coughs> and so, um, 
Yeah, let's do it. So magnesium chloride, okay? Magnesium chloride, magnesium is in, so I always do my tables. I don't know if you guys have had me in the past or not. Number, valence electrons, and total. Magnesium, and I'm going to exit this for just a second, and um, actually discard because I want to be able to come back and write on top of that. Magnesium is in group 2. Chlorine is in group 7. There it is, 25. So as we do this, you know, atom, number, valence electrons, total, magnesium, chlorine. There's one magnesium, two chlorines. Valence electrons, magnesium is in group 2. Chlorine is in group 7. 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times 7 is 14, total we should have 16, okay? Magnesium is furthest from fluorine, so it's going to be my central atom. I'm going to form a bond between my central and everything else. And now I'm going to fill in my octets. Now if I go back, yeah, 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 we don't fill in the octets on groups 1 through 3. We're just going to fill it in on our chlorines. Oops. So this chlorine has two, four, six, eight. This chlorine has two, four, six, eight. So if we look, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. I don't care that magnesium doesn't have an octet because it didn't want one to begin with. But now let's count up the electrons and see if we have the right number. One, two, three, four. Oops, I'm sorry, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. So we have the right number, so this is probably the right structure. There's two areas of electron density around magnesium, so this is a nice linear structure. I don't know what, what I'm pressing to do that. I must be doing something, though. For carbon dioxide, here I've got carbon and oxygen, 1 and 2. Carbon is in group 4, so it has four valence electrons. Oxygen is in group 6, so it has 6. 1 times 4 is 4. 2 times 6 is 12. 4 plus 12 is 16. Carbon is further away from fluorine than oxygen, so I'm going to put it in the middle. And, you know, just for a second, I'm going to go ahead and do my valence structures. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oxygen, 1, 2, 3. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You can kind of tell I have room for two bonds here and four bonds on the carbon. And so it kind of makes sense to pick carbon in the middle. Um, putting it back. Um, I'm going to pick carbon in the middle, make a bond to everything else, and I'm going to fill in my octets. Now, none of these are group 1 through 3, so I'm going to fill in the octet on everything. This oxygen has 2, 4, 6, 8. Carbon has 2 and 4, so I'm going to add two lone pairs to make 6 and 8. This oxygen has 2, 4, 6, 8. Now if we count this up, <coughs> 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. That is not 16, which means we have inadvertently drawn too many electrons. What it means is we probably have a multiple bond if we go back to the rules. Um, and so what it means is we've accidentally drawn the right thing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate a lone pair from the central and a different atom, and we're going to make a multiple bond. Okay? So I'm going to take these two electrons, and I'm going to draw it as a multiple bond down here. And so I'm going to redo this. I'm going to do black so it's different. Um, Everything else is going to be the same. I don't like to erase. I want you guys to see what I did different. And so if we count this up, this oxygen still has 2, 4, 6, 8. Carbon still has 2, 4, 6, 8. And the overall structure now has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Hey, we still have too many, but at least it's closer. 
So now we're going to draw it again. This time I'm going to eliminate these two lone pairs. You know, there's a little bit of debate. You know, you could probably try to do this lone pair in, on, in this oxygen. But if you keep it symmetrical, your formal charges and stuff just kind of work out. And so to save us time, I'm going to only focus on um, keeping it symmetrical and to show you how this works, OK? Now, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this exactly the same way. I'm just going to have um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, you know, uh, can I think I can fit it here. Double bond here still looks the same. Now this lone pair is here. This still looks the same. We count up. This oxygen has 2, 4, 6, 8. This carbon has 2, 4, 6, 8. Oxygen has 2, 4, 6, 8. So everybody's octet is full. And if we count up the valence electrons, 1, 2, uh, sorry, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. It's the right number here. Now, guys, <clears throat> there are still only two areas. Uh -oh. OK, it's not flashing, so I think you guys can still hear me. There's still only two areas of electron density here um, around carbon. Doesn't matter that there's still two, two double bonds. It's only two sides of the carbon that has those electrons. And so the furthest away those can get is a nice linear structure. So this is, again, a nice linear orientation, OK? <clears throat> Doesn't matter, single bonds, double bonds. If there's only two sides of the central that are being used, it is <clears throat> a nice linear structure, OK? Now, um, I have to erase because I'm out of room, but if uh, you're on a different sheet of paper, so you can keep going. I'm going to do ammonia. Goodness gracious. Come on. OK, so for ammonia, we have nitrogen and hydrogens here. Nitrogen is in group 5, and that means it's going to have five valence electrons. Hydrogen is in group 1. It only has one. And so what that's going to do for us, H1 and 3, 5, 1, that gives us 5 plus 3 gives us 8 total. Nitrogen, um, even though nitrogen is closer to fluorine, if you think back to the Lewis structure, this can form three bonds. Hydrogen only has room for one bond, so nitrogen goes in the middle because it can only form one bond. I mean, because it can form more bonds. I'm sorry, more bonds. Nitrogen goes in the middle. We draw bonds to everything else. And now we're going to fill in our octets. We don't fill in an octet on hydrogen. It wants only a duet, so it's fine. Nitrogen has two, four, six. We're going to put a lone pair there to make it eight. Counting up the structure, two, four, six, eight. We have the right number of valence electrons. This is now going to have four areas of electron density. I don't know what I am doing. There we go. Um, and so the bond angle, you have two that are going to be in the same plane. That's probably too big, more like that. Then you have one that's coming out into the, you know, shooting out at you, really. And then this one that goes into the plane of the um, screen here. And so the bond angles are 109 degrees-ish. <laughs> 109 degrees. And this is going to be um, trigonal pyramidal. For carbon, carbon um, has four valence electrons. Hydrogen has one, gives us four plus four is eight. Carbon goes in the middle because it can form the most bonds. Single bond to everything else. Two, four, six, eight. It's already got its octet. We have the right number of um, electrons. And so this is a nice tetrahedral shape. The difference between here and the trigonal pyramidal 
is that one of these for the trigonal pyramidal is a lone pair and you don't really see it. That's the only difference here. Bond angles are still the same, okay? Or at least, you know, they might be a little bit smaller with the lone pair, but for my purposes in this unit, they're the same. You know, it's, it's good enough. <clears throat> now, the great thing about carbon, guys, is if carbon can form th four bonds, a second ago we did CO2 where we had, you know, the two double bonds. Carbon can also have, you know, the single bonds like here with the hydrogen. But there's another couple of things that we can do. And in organic chemistry, the, the vast majority of possibilities is what's great about carbon. Carbon can have, you know, a double bond and two single bonds. It can have um, the occasional triple bond and a single bond. As long as there are four bonds total around carbon, it's happy. And so that is going to form the basis of this unit, okay? Now, as we are talking about bonding, um, one of the things that's really kind of maybe not mandatory but helpful to discuss is hybridization. Now, in 111, we talk a lot about the different orbitals. There's s orbitals and p orbitals and d orbitals. And what happens is, you know, for electron configuration, we put the electrons in an orbital. But when you form a bond, you have two orbitals from different atoms coming together. And what happens is you end up getting a mix or a hybrid orbital. And so, you know, you have the spherical s orbitals, the dumbbell-shaped p orbitals. And when you have um, hybrid orbitals, what's going to happen is this dumbbell ends up just kind of looking lopsided. And so you end up getting an sp hybrid. Now, the way that you can tell hybridization, sp hybridization, there's 1s, 1p. It's a combination of 1s and 1p orbital. And generally, those are going to be um, linear molecules or just two areas around that central are being used. sp2 hybridization, you have 1s, 2p orbitals that are forming that hybrid. Um, and so this is usually going to be like 120 degree bond angle, whereas this was 180. sp3 hybridization, 1s, 3ps. And so you have four orbitals here that are involved. And so you have the three-dimensional structure with about 109 degree bond angles, OK? And so the other thing to kind of keep in mind is um, as we are looking at these bonds, depending on whether it's a single bond or a double bond, it's going to have implications for whether or not it can rotate. If you just have a single bond, you know, um, you're holding on that one strand, that one bond you can, you know, rotate around this, it's going to be, um, you know, no big deal. But if you have two bonds, you have the first bond is going to be sigma, um, which means head on, the sigma bond looks like that. It's an indication of head on. Pi bonds um, are going to be above and below, or, you know, if you rotate this, this could be like in front and behind. And the, the difference here is if you have one strand, you can rotate around, but if you have two, it's kind of like a ladder. You can't twist a ladder because it's being held in orientation. And so sigma bonds um, are the first bond between any two molecules. If you have a multiple bond, that's when you would add in a pi bond or call it a pi bond. Um, but in three dimensions and two dimensions, however you're going to consider it, sigma bonds allow for rotation. Pi bonds do not. So when you have a pi bond, you're going to end up having a little less flexibility and a little less ability to um, really uh, move. And what's really interesting is that these pi bonds, because they don't move, there's a little bit more area around them, they're going to be susceptible to attack and bond breaking, which is going to be really neat as we talk about organic um, reactions, okay? 
So that's kind of the basis for 111 review. We are going to talk about some of these concepts some more. But the idea here is um, I want you to really be comfortable um, with why the structures are what they are and what the polarity of those structures are. And then most importantly of all, know that um, carbon can form four bonds.